This is The View with Whoopi, Nicole Wallace, Rosie Perez, and Rosie O'Donnell. It all starts now. View. Hello and welcome back to the table. This is so great. We are back as we were originally. Yeah. This is the view. Good to have you so, back, honey. Yeah, honey, you've been rehearsing your behind off. Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, so last know, night, first preview. Pr first Tell preview. everybody. Well, it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> there is not a weak link in the cast. My entire cast is fabulous. Larry David was letter perfect last night. Not one slip up. And this man always thinks he's going to mess up. And, and it was perfect. We got a standing ovation. How about that? <laughs> Tell the name of the play and what the theater yes. is. Uh, the name of the play is Fish in the Dock. Uh, written and starring uh, Larry David, written by starring Larry David, and um, also starring Rita Wilson. Mm -hmm. And um, it's at the Court Theater, yes. C O R T, yes. on 48th. And there are no tickets. You go online, you can sit like. Well, the previews. Oh, oh, okay, wait, wait. Can you go back to that? <laughs> I just. Did I see what I think? I... Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Just as I saw it, I thought, it's hit me, what the hell? Yeah, that was Rita's idea because every single day when we walked into the rehearsal studios on 42nd, I walked in, I went, we'll be still with me. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, every single day she goes, let's Good. take a picture. And, oh, uh, it's wonderful. I'm it's like wonderful. bad gas, I stick around. <laughs> But it's wonderful. The play is amazing. The audiences were, were just laughing nonstop. And how are you feeling? Girl, I am feeling fabulous. Good for you, I am baby. feeling fabulous. Yes. I, am, I am very, very, very happy to be back. And may I just say, mi gente, gracias. Aww. That's right. Mi gente. <laughs> gracias. And let me, let me to them. That is your seat, sister. Oh, That's right. We're glad you're here. Yeah. I'm glad to. Thank, Thank you. God. Thank you. So, let's just start talking, girl. Because one of the hottest political properties for both parties, apparently, right now is Pitbull. I don't mean the dog. I mean Pitbull, the singer. He's appeared on campaign stops for President Obama in the past, but now the Republicans are making a strong play to get him to join the Republican Party for 2016 election. But can Pitbull really influence voters? That is a question I guess that's on everybody's mind. Yeah. Well, he's, he's a very, very important person because not only is he a worldwide entertainer, mm. he's also a very, very prominent businessman. Mm -hmm. And so the Republican Party is not only thinking about his popularity, his social media popularity, they're also thinking about his business sense, too, uh -huh. and uh -huh. that he reaches a lot of people. And, yeah. and, and it's, 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 an important, it's an important person to go after, mm -hmm. but I really think that he's not going to lean to the Republican Party. They're, they're anti-immigration. How are you going to try to woo a Cuban-American to a side that's anti-immigration? Yeah, good point. Yeah. And Very he, good point. Well, 
The story in the paper is about Ana Navarro, who's an advisor to Jeb Bush, who was making the case to Pitbull about Jeb Bush, who actually has a more enlightened position on immigration. And, and I've said this here, Republicans have to be, um, I think, for comprehensive immigration reform, for a path to citizenship for the 17 million people who are already here. Um, not just because it's the only way to win an election, but because it's the right thing to do. But Pitbull is a Cuban American. Pitbull is from a, an historically vital voting block in an historically vital state, Florida. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a block where the younger generation of Cubans really don't lean Republicans. But but the fight over Pitbull is a great one for Republicans to have because if it means that they go and fight for the Latino vote, if it means that they go and make their case to every American, if it means that they go and take the conservative message to Pitbull and to the Latinos, they used to get 44% of the Latino vote. George Bush got 44% of the Hispanic vote. Mm. I think Mitt Romney got 12. Mm. So if you want to know why Republicans are losing elections, look at how they're doing with Latinos. I so thought you were going to say look important. at Mitt Romney. That no. would have been mean. <laughs> but, but, but look at, yeah. That would have been mean. But it's I thought very, it, it wouldn't have been unfair though. I mean, it's a very, very, very important group of Americans. And also, and if you do decide to do that, um, Republican friends, may I suggest that you actually follow through on the promises you make, because. One of the reasons folks are not sure is because you feel sometimes like you're being smooshed up. What is it called? Pa not pandered, pandered, but pandered yeah. to. Yeah. Both uh, parties do for it. just the vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if you're going to, be, if you really want to get something going, then I suggest that you really make sure you you follow through. And but I would give anything yeah. to see Pitbull sing and perform at a Republican convention. Not Republicans would never, had never seen anything like it. Believe me, we've never seen anything like Pitbull. Never Good luck. Yeah, yeah. Good I, we luck. need it. We need it. Good we luck. need, we I, need I the luck. I also want to say that also uh, Pitbull is a very uh, philanthropic person. Yes. And he has a lot of causes under his belt, and yeah. one is education. So that's another reason why they are courting him. Well, perhaps yeah. if they, sure. if you show your love of education, <laughs> that would be a really great thing because then everyone would say, well, hey, we kind of didn't know that y'all felt like that. It would be a good thing to say. <laughs> Not such a good thing to see is uh, the family of Bobby Christina Brown is keeping a, a hospital bedside vigil, according to some right now. Some news outlets claim that her condition has improved since she was found unresponsive in a bathtub on Saturday. The hospital, however, has not released an official statement, and I don't think the family has either. But folks are very concerned. Yeah, nearly three years to the day that her mother was found dead. And, you know, a little kid like that who lived through her mother's addiction as well. And you know it's tragic. Yeah, I mean I, it's beyond uh, it's beyond the worst nightmare that you could have for her after su surviving such a tragic loss. Yeah, and we were talking earlier. Um, I just thought that movie that came out, and this is no disrespect to Angela Bassett because I love Angela Bassett, but an un unauthorized bi biography of her mom. It must have killed her. This no was pun, a lifetime uh, that movie? That was a terrible, that was a terrible phrasing. Let me take that back. It must have really hurt her yes. deeply mm -hmm. to watch that. And, uh, you know, we, we, we forget that these people are human beings. Yeah. You know, and we sit yeah. there and we talk about people, we put people into the tabloids, and we forget we're human beings. Do you remember, though, the, um, yeah, the um, reality show? Being Bobby Brown, where they were both, you know, so high every episode, and they just put it on the air, and nobody seemed to care, and it was quite obviously two people in the throes of severe addiction, and there was a child there, and they just ran it, and nobody seemed to care. And so now, when this tragedy has happened, I hope people open their eyes a little bit, you know? Well, I will say this. Uh, Whitney's mom cared a lot about that freaking yes, show did. she did not yes yeah, she was really vocal about I th yeah well i think she probably didn't was. care it be before it because it showed the truth right well I, I think she didn't care for it because a there was a kid there yeah b that's her daughter and c nobody wants to see their family member for the sake of a television exploited. show exploited the way they were and because she's she was the mother and not you know, a guardian anymore of, of uh, her daughter. Yeah. She had to sit back and watch. But I just wanted to say, because, you know, she will call and say, look, I did complain about that show, so I just want to make sure, I, yes, we know. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
What about this? Because one of the many images going viral from the Super Bowl is Patriots coach Bill Belichick getting a, or planting a victory kiss on his adult daughter. Now, you know, they were celebrating a lot of people. And <laughs> apparently, people are creeped out by this. I mean, I'm not sure why. You know, it's just, you know, mwah. It, you're you're in the I moment. Just you just want. Like more than just like, I mean, I, I've never kissed do my you dad see like that. I, I, I don't see any tongues. <laughs> I mean, I, I, see, that's what would creep me out. I, I mean, I'm, I'm Greek and we're kissers, but I have never kissed my parents like that. It just looks like a really I big kiss. Mom. I used to kiss my mom on the lips. Yeah, I kiss uh, my kids wherever yeah. they will let me. <laughs> me too. They were like, you know, they get to be 15, get away from me. I'm like, get over here. I'll kiss them everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think people are making a lot out of nothing, but that's what I think. Well, it was an emotional moment. Of course, right. He, he won, won a Super he won. Bowl. Yeah. But I think we should, I don't think we should really have the last say in this. So we want to ask our viewers what they think about this. Let us know on Twitter and Facebook. Do you think it was a creepy moment? Or is it just one of those things that why you got to kiss? A really big one. A really big one with no tongues. We'll be right back with the more hot topics. The Fifty Shades of Grey movie is loaded with sizzling, over-the-top sex. Do you want to watch this in a room full of strangers at the movies? DC. of Fifty Shades of Grey apparently is going to be the raunchiest mainstream film in more than a decade with 20 minutes of sex scenes. It's over 100 minutes running time. So the question then, I guess, becomes, do you want to be watching this in a crowded movie theater <laughs> with a whole bunch of people you don't know? <laughs> Or are you going to go see it anyway, like my daughter? She doesn't care. She's going to see it. She and 55 of her girlfriends are going to see this movie. Yeah, so I think people are going to go see this movie in oh, droves. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people read the books on the subway. I don't know why they're going to be uncomfortable <laughs> watching the movie with I, other I people, know. right? I think that's a real sort of guy question. Maybe. I mean, I, how many guys do you think are going to go see Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> There's one guy up there waving, saying, I'm going to go see it. <laughs> I remember I went to see the movie The Hunger with mm -hmm. Susan Sarandon and Catherine yes. Deneuve. Yes. And I remember in that movie theater going, my head may explode any moment. And I was so embarrassed. It was like the first sort of gay woman love scene in a right, movie. And right, I was right. like just out of high school. Right. Oh, what? my Lord. What about Last Tango in Paris? Yeah. I never saw that. For nine and a half weeks? Uh, how graphic is that? With the stick of butter? Mmm. <laughs> Netflix, people, Netflix. <laughs> I was, I was shocked when, when the scene in uh, Last Tango in Paris, right. when he tells her, you got you to gotta clip your, 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 your nails. And I remember being so young, I go, why does he want her to clip his nails? And when I got older, I went, oh, my God. Yeah. Was, yeah. was, so my problem with Fifty Shades of Grey, I am going to go see it because mm -hmm. my friend Victor Rasek is going to be yes. in it. And yes. I think he's going to come on the show. Yes. But also, uh, my problem with it is that they're going to have full frontal of women, but not of men. Oh, really? It's terrible. When I agree. We're not going to get to see the mean potatoes. You're not going to get to see the man's hoo-ha, but you can but see I the woman's hoo-ha. I think that I was. I think that is fair. But I think they fought really hard to keep an R rating. They didn't want an N, what is it, NC-77. Uh, they didn't that's, want that's, an that's, X. That's the problem that I have. Want. Why is a woman's vagina not R-rated, uh, not X. X rated, but a man's penis is? I well, I yeah. I think. <laughs> because, all the women went, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> because I think that the people who made the ratings. Why? Because I think the people who made the ratings are were men. You know, and I think for them, seeing a woman naked was much easier on them than seeing a guy like swinging it. in the wind. <laughs> I think that's what I think, you know, baseball bat and all. I don't know that I, you know, I don't actually want to see anybody's hoo-ha. I want to get the idea that the hoo-ha is there and y'all are doing something with it, but I don't want to see it happen. I'd rather, you know, if I'm going to watch, I'm going to watch me in my house with a mirror on the ceiling. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, 
$16.50 to go see somebody else do this. I mean, I... But a lot I of hope people, it's better than... A lot of people are going to go... I mean, these oh, books were a drones. phenomenon. Yes, people yes, are gonna go, yes. You know, girls are going together. I think, I think the good thing about these books, women started talking about sex in a more open way. And I think that if the movie has the same effect, I think it's a good thing. Well, mm. we shall see. Because, yeah. you know, it's going to be soon. And you know we're going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. but, how about this? In an interview with Harper's Bazaar, actress Kate Winslet says her two divorces actually benefited her children because it taught them that everyone is faced with struggles at some point, and it shapes who we are. I think that's wonderful. Me too. Actually, I, I, I think true. it's true. Yeah, yeah, it is. Nobody yeah. gets out unscathed, right? No. Fifty no. percent of marriages end in divorce. Something like eighty percent of second marriages. So you know, it's a tough thing to do. And I think kids, they're along for the ride. They see what's going on, and they understand the reality. We had that white picket fence, you know, the Disney or or the Brady's. Mm -hmm. Like I was constantly waiting for my father to marry Betty Buckley from Eight Is Enough, right. or you know, Julie Andrews was going to come in and make us close out of curtains, and right. Right. the motherless house would be alive again. Right. And you all have this thing, this image of the way it has to be, but then you get into your life and you're mm -hmm. fifty something, and you go, "Wow, that's not exactly what I planned, right?" Well, it's always a surprise. I yeah. mean, that's the great thing about life is just when you think you know what's coming, some new stuff shows up, and you're like, "What the hell?" Yeah. yeah. What the hell? But I think that it is hard on the kids, and I. And, and I think that, I think it's how the parents deal with it, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. if, if you have a parent that doesn't deal with it well, yeah. then it's not going to be good for the child. Yeah, right. and if two parents are not dealing well, it's really hell for the kids. So yeah. I guess that's our message to divorced parents. Be nice to your kids. It ain't their fault. Yeah, I actually did a doc on that for HBO called Don't Divorce Yes, me. you yeah. did. Yes, I did about how parents can help their children and their families get through divorce without there being tremendous collateral damage. And as Rosie Perez says, Netflix people, Netflix. Yeah. We'll be right back with even more Hot Topics. It's the sharpest needle in politics right now. How presidential hopefuls coming out strong about vaccinations could infect their chances in 2016. Stay. I mean, as crazy as this is, the measles outbreak has made vaccinations now a political hot button issue. Now, Republican Chris Christie has just clarified comments that he made about giving parents a choice to vaccinate. And Rand Paul, the doctor, you know, just came out with even stronger comments. Take a look. I've heard of many tragic cases of walking, talking, normal children who wound up with profound mental disorders after vaccines. I'm not arguing vaccines are a bad idea. I think they're a good thing. But I think the parents should have some input. The state doesn't okay. own your children. Parents own the children. And it is an issue of freedom. Hmm. That guy's a medical doctor. That's kind of funny because it's inaccurate information. Right? Yeah, listen, I think yeah. when you become a parent, you ask all the hard questions of your pediatrician. When we had a baby, we went to the pediatrician. And when you live in New York City, your kid can't go to preschool unless they have had every vaccine required by law and the flu shot. So, I mean, doctors aren't messing around. And I think this is one area where Republicans are in grave peril of ignoring the science on this. Yeah, because the science is quite clear. Yeah. You know what? There are a lot of reasons that autism happens, but the science has said over the years of them looking and trying, because this has been important to them, it isn't the vaccines. So if you are going to have children, you have to be responsible. If you want to be a parent, you got to be responsible. Other kids' children are now become your kids' friends. So why would you put them in peril? And one of the things that doctors want folks to know is you have the right as a parent to say, don't give 50 uh, vaccination shots at one time. We can break it up. I mean, it just makes sense yeah. to say that. But, uh, you know, this idea that you've seen a lot of folks whose, you know, mental capacity has been affected by vaccines just, it's just... Do. Well, and Rand Paul is an interesting <coughs> figure in the Republican Party. He actually, last night in, in a different interview, he does a lot of interviews, um, he does. went after Jeb Bush 
for his position on medicinal marijuana. So on the one hand, he's got some progressive ideas mm -hmm. for Republicans. But this debate about vaccines, I, I'm telling you, this is trouble for Republicans because you cannot find a doctor on this planet who will tell you that there's any danger to vaccinating your kids. In fact, if you have a child under one, we learned from Dr. Besser yesterday yeah. that you can't even have the measles vaccine until you're one. Yeah. So you're endangering every infant. I mean, it, it is a scary idea for me that my political party is going to start showing some ambivalence about vaccinations. It's terrible. Hillary Clinton, I think, said, said something smart. She said, the science is clear, the earth is round, the sky is blue, and vaccines work. Let's pretend our, protect our kids. Hashtag grandmothers know best. to just um, go back to something you just lightly skimmed over was pot? Where, yes the pot you know um, let's go there yes please let's go there because Jeb Bush smoked pot now here's this man what if he was caught what if he was caught and he was convicted? He could have faced serious jail time. He would never been able to be governor. Mm -hmm. He would never been able to run for president. And I just think that we need to be clear. There are people in this nation that smoke marijuana. Yes. And there are people who are rich, very, very wealthy, mm -hmm. that lights up in a hot second. And we should just stop playing games and address this issue on a mature, serious level. Well, we because should. Because it's, yeah. it's not being done. It's not being done. And you know, and there's a lot of kids of color who are incarcerated now, and they go, mm -hmm. you know, that criming white, while white, it also uh, applies to drugs. You yeah, know, and, totally. and you know, you go to these fancy parties and you see these rich millionaires come out of their bedrooms with bags of pot, and you're like, for real? For you real? don't even need to be a rich millionaire to see that. <laughs> no, my point you know, is, is that yeah. those are the ones that are not, you know, really taking on this issue. They're like kind of backing away. I have nothing well, to do I with it. Well, I saw a great documentary. She said, the woman who watches nothing but documentaries, where, uh, you know, black people and white people or people of color and white people actually use drugs the same amount, but actually who's prosecuted and arrested for it, disproportionately people of color. So those are the statistics, and it's a very uh, sad state. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And can I show you one more thing before we sure. go? Sure. Check out these sneakers. Yeah. And uh, they are hot off the press. There's a very famous artist. What's his name? Hayes. And who is he? My husband. That's right. And he's fantastic. Where can you find Where can that? You, you you sold got, out? No, they're, they're sold out in the bigger size, but there's there's other sizes, but they're they're uh, a limited edition, and you can only get them at the Nike Lab. Um, so yes, I'm very proud of you, honey. You did really well. I'm proud of you too, honey. Thank you for That's giving right. me free sneakers, honey. That's right. There you go. Now I know this is going to sound a bit weird coming out of this conversation mm -hmm. with Pod and great sneakers, and <laughs> but the comedy, dear white people. <laughs> was just released on DVD Blu-ray, and members of our audience are going home with a copy. Yeah. It's a great little movie, which I think you'll enjoy. And we will come back with a white person we like a lot called Martin Short. We'll be right back with Martin. Yeah. He's playing all those unforgettable characters winching his head. Martin Short tells you why he calls himself a humble comedy legend. Next. right now. He's on Broadway in the hit comedy It's Only a Play, and this is his memoir called I Must Say My Life as a Humble Comedy Legend. He's about to take part in the historic SNL 40th anniversary special. Please welcome our friend, Marty Short! <laughs> Oh, Let me spread into the there cheeks. You yeah. We were having the greatest conversation. Tell me again, we were, you were just saying backstage why you feel Donald Trump's the best candidate for president. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, we've never elected 
interrupted anybody without great hair before. I know. So, I just, I, we got interrupted, and I was yeah, curious about yeah. your thoughts. Well, you know, we really have a thing in this country for hair. Yes, you so do. that's what we were talking about. If that was hair. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. See? So, Marty, you know, now I just you know. want to say, you are the funniest human. And sitting next to you at a dinner makes life worth living. We have had some of those dinners. We have had some of those. Tell me about stepping into a role originated by Mr. Nathan Lane. Well, it's an insane thing to do. You know, there's no, no greater performer on Broadway, I guess, than Nathan Lane. And it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, oh, Nathan. Happy birthday, Nathan. Uh, so I, 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 I did it in a kind of a daunting thing, but I was very apprehensive because, you know, there's so many things that I've been doing in the book and the movie and the television show and I'm Florence Henderson's, you know, friend with benefits. So, um... <laughs> she told me about I, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't think I had time. And then, um, uh, but I had dinner in October with the great Mike Nichols, mm. who was uh, a, a great friend. And uh, he said, I hear you're doing this play. And I said, gee, I'm not sure if I'm doing this play, actually. Mm. And then the following Wednesday, he got back and he phoned me up and said, you have to do this play. And I'll tell you why you have to do this play. And he listed all these reasons. And I got off the phone and I phoned my agent and said, the Pope has spoken. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's the right. play. Yeah. You know, That's because right. as we all That's know, right. well, Mike would phone and say that. That's right. There was no real argument. No, because, because was he was no one, always right. Because there was no one smarter. Not There was a, no yeah. one smarter. He was, he was very good. He once said to me, I just, he once said to me uh, we were at an art opening. And about 10 years ago, and he said, where are you staying? And I said, the Essex house. He said, no, but really. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask you, now, you're in this play with these legends, Stocker Channing yes. and Matthew Broderick. But, and they'll tell you. But you interviewed, well, you interviewed them. Can we show a little clip oh, of sure. this? Oh, sure. Okay, Absolutely. Let's do that. Murray Abraham. Hello. Hello. F stands for? It stands for famous. You are. Oh, absolutely. I'm sitting with a brilliant young actor, Matthew <laughs> Rudderock. Rudderick. So you have never done topless on stage? No. Have you? Well, bottomless, I suppose I should no, say. No, I even flipped topless. this out in a moment's notice. I'll do it now if you'd like, because I play to my strengths. Uh-huh. And uh, you played Simba in Sophie's Choice. It was the love. Uh -huh. I got a call. <laughs> So much fun. This cast is Matthew Broderick, and, you know, yeah. speaking of great, brilliant Broadway stars in Stockard, my God, yeah. and Katie Finneran. I love Katie. Is this Katie the first too. time you've worked with these guys? Uh, yes, the first time. Really? Yeah. Oh. I, I, I played M uh, Matthew's role in the uh, L.A. production of The Producers. Okay. But I, no, I never worked with Matthew. But I, he's no friend. you have a backstage etiquette that you adhere to. Well, uh, you come backstage when you see a play, and you lie. Yeah. I mean, I hate people that come back and feel that truth is important. Never. You know? <laughs> well, especially, I don't mind it if it's like civilians, but if like actors come back and say, you know, I'd love to say it's good, but I, I can't lie. And I want to say, yeah, yeah, you can't act either. Right, exactly. <laughs> Just do what I did with your last two films. <laughs> Right, it's all By the way, I, sp I was speaking to Larry David. Oh, yeah? Uh, 15 minutes ago, and he said, Tell Rosie she's so brilliant and she was so fantastic, and I'm sorry I dropped the line last night. He said he dropped the line. Uh, did he? Yeah, he did. Well, he wouldn't have said that. Yeah, yeah. No. But he said, You know what? It went pretty well, which means if Larry says that, it means it went through the roof. Right. It went through the roof. He yeah. didn't drop a line last night, he dropped it Saturday night. <laughs> yeah. But it was funny because I'm, I'm waiting for him to say his line, and he's going, What? Oh, you know? what? So yeah. I have a line? <laughs> <laughs> so now, you're. You've opened the door to this. So do you have this great memoir, which Rosie just mentioned. She's holding this great book called My Life is a Humble Comedy Legend. And in it, you write a lot about your great SCTV and SNL characters, Ed Grimley. This is coming Nathan to you Thurman. off the top of your head. I'm just making it up. It's wicked. Wow. It's amazing. I, I guess what I <laughs> really want to know is... When you're creating a character, is it somebody that you've seen? Is it something that's just jumped in your head? And will you do one of them for us? Well, I... I... <laughs> I, think that, I think that character...
raptors are, are usually, to give it a three dimension, a third dimension, it's based on a real person. Mm -hmm. You know, Jimmy Glick was a character. When I was a kid on my street, there was a guy who, if you stayed off his lawn for a whole year, he'd let you go to a movie. And his voice went very high and very low. And I thought, I'm going to remember that and make thousands someday. <laughs> but, uh, oh, but Front from the, uh, from the Bride was uh, just based on the idea that the father was so disconnected from the process of the wedding <laughs> that he wouldn't quite understand. My favorite line is when you say, I love it, we change everything. Yes, we love it, change everything. Well, you know, and he talks, now I do it in my show, we, I critique who has style, not style. Like Kim Kardashian, I say, you know, her derriere is too big. There are parts that have not been downloaded on Google Maps. You know, I just... <laughs> <laughs> well, Marty, we could not love you more. Well, I love you. No, I love you more. No, but I really do, though. Okay, well, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. You can catch him, and it's only a play, at the Jacob Bernie Jacobs Theater here in New York City, and members of our audience are going home with a pair of tickets <laughs> to the show. a Taiwanese American family who moves down south to find their American dream but not everybody is on board take a look I don't know why we have to move why couldn't you keep on going back and forth between Orlando and DC because I didn't come to America to work for your mom's brother selling furniture for the rest of my life your father is right this is why we left Chinatown in DC this is why we left our family and friends exactly this is why we left everything we know to come to a place where we know nothing and where the humidity is not good for my hair <laughs> please welcome Randall Park and Hudson Yang thank you very nice very nice to have you now before we uh, talk about your sitcom okay. that looks hilarious I want to talk about the interview was I in the interview? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was you with the little yeah, panic, maybe. Yeah, 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 I think I remember you that. You played yeah. the dictator. That's right. Yes. Were you scared to death? <laughs> I was never scared. No. I like I, I never worried for my life, but so many of my friends and family would call me, and they were scared. Yeah. Yeah, like you know, friends would call me and be like, "Hey, if you need a place to hide out, right? You know, <laughs> you know I, you could stay in my apartment." And I'd hang up the phone, and then I'd see myself on the news yeah. and then I'd be like maybe I should hide out in that apartment. Yeah. 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 Were well, you surprised yeah. by the response? Of course. Yeah, well, really? uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, none of us were expecting that. It, we were completely blindsided. And about and, uh, the hacking, were you scared about the hacking? Did you delete all your naked photos on your... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. All of them. Gone. Yeah. <laughs> Polaroids burned. Um. <laughs> well, you were very good in that. You gave him some compassion and humanity uh, in the movie. It was a Thank funny, you. sketchy kind of character, but yeah. you did wonderfully in I that. really appreciate that. Now, Thanks. Hudson, how old are you, my son? I'm 11. 11. Is this your first acting gig? No. What was your first one? Uh, I was a small part in a indie film, I think. What was it called? Uh, Sisterhood of Night. Oh, you were great in that. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see it, Hudson. I'm lying. <laughs> How did you get that adorable dimple, and why do you only have one? Well, I was running around in Pottery Barn, yeah. and I tripped. Yeah. <laughs> and so basically, it's a Pottery Barn made. I fell, hit my cheek, and then it just stayed. Seriously? <laughs> like a tiny clip but tell everybody more about what the show's about Hudson. Well the show is about um, an Asian American family that moves from Washington DC to Orlando and so they have to try to fit in and become part of the society I guess or the community and so Randall my dad in the show um, he has a restaurant that he thinks will be successful and so he tries many different ways to make it like so people would like it and it would be fun and I think that's it. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. pretty that's good. good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really Very good. nice, Hudson. Oh, it's so cute. Oh my Very God. Very good. Do your parents encourage you to be entertainers? Did they, were they encouraging? Well, my dad and my mom, they, they supported anything I wanted. Mm -hmm. They didn't care if whatever I wa wanted to be, I could be. So oh, yeah, nice. they supported me. That's very sweet. Yeah. They also drove you to the audition. Yeah, that's nice too. 
And about Hudson's audition, this guy, I mean, they cast a very wide net. We saw so many kids, and so many of them were so talented. But this kid walked in, and it, it genuinely seemed like he did not care whether he got that part or not. <laughs> he just, like, That's came in. Yeah, that's the trick. That's With the a trick. swagger to him, and right away we're like, that's the kid. Yeah. Well, all thanks to Randall Park and Hudson Yang, the two hour premiere event of Fresh Off the Boat airs tomorrow night at 8 30 p.m. and 9 30 p.m. right here on ABC, and we will be right back. Thank you very much. February 17th on ABC. I think something should be said about the four of us being back together. You will hear a lot of rumors. You've heard a lot of rumors. But we are here. This is the view, y'all. This is the <laughs> view. Right. So everybody, have a great day. And take a little time to enjoy the